the planet X, what is the real name of that? Do you know what the real name of planet X is? Well, it goes by a bunch of names. The, it, it goes, goes by ninth planet, tenth planet, Nibiru. They call it Gabriel's Fist. They call it Lucifer's Hammer. They are all these names. But what, what's interesting, the ancients had such amazing uh, understanding of the heavens, taught to them by their fallen angel progenitors. And the deal is, is that every so many thousand years, this planet comes into our solar system. It comes into the Earth's orbit and basically disrupts everything on Earth. Yeah, you, that's why there are planets in our solar system that go in retrograde motion. That means opposite of the spin of the other ones. Why this is critical at this time, didn't Jesus tell us there'd be signs in the sun, moon, and stars? Yes. Yeah, and see, so people say, well, you guys get into all this stuff, it doesn't matter. Remember, the Bible says that God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This should answer your question. It's not that God doesn't tell people what's going on, it's that they reject it. So the reason this is important is, and I, let me spell it out even, the, the narrative that's going to be promoted, and Tom Horn writes about this extensively, is the Vatican's getting ready to baptize aliens. Well, I can tell you, they're not creating the image and likeness of God. The best way to understand this is every boundary and every barrier that God put into effect for our safety because he loves us, that he put in for to protect us, Evil men, in conjunction with fallen angels, okay, are now breaking those barriers down. That's what Jesus meant when he said the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. If you understand this, that the narrative is simply this. God and Jesus aren't real. The Anunnaki, the space brothers, the aliens created us. Science fiction, from the days of its black and white inception, have been building and building and building towards us, okay? The whole reason, Jim, they hide all of the artifacts and the truth is because if they acknowledge fallen angels, they acknowledge the book of Genesis. If they acknowledge the book of Genesis, they acknowledge the God of Genesis. I was mentioning how there's, there's certain entities out there, institutions that have been confiscating and concealing the existence of not only giants, a host of other things. And also, and who also, does it? Tell me. Well, and not only confiscating and concealing, but also controlling, also controlling the narrative concerning the megaliths and concerning the world, uh, the ancient world, what we, call, what we refer to as the prehistoric world. What? We've discovered this, okay? In a, in, a word, in a phrase, all roads lead to Rome. Everywhere we go around the world, all roads lead to Rome. We're finding that the, wow. the, main, uh, the, the, the main power behind the cover-up, at least the institution that knows, for sure, a lot of this information, they have it, they know the truth, but they have kept it concealed, for sure, is the Vatican. And there's a reason why they're doing it. And this is a conspiracy, it's a vast conspiracy, and it has to do with the deception that we talked about. Steve said something that, something that Steve's famous for saying, and that is sort of the byline of our film, is those who control the past determine the future. And what we mean by that is, if you can conceal the truth of the past, if you can keep people in the dark concerning what was, then you can deceive people concerning what is yet to be. That is so true. Because the, the procession of history is going full circle back to the beginning. So true. And wow. the Vatican is leading As the it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah. That's what Jesus you, says. You can't really understand the prophetic future unless you understand the prehistoric past. But, and by the way, the Bible lays this out for us in, in, in the sixth chapter of Genesis. That's why our production company is called Gen 6 Production. Oh, thank and you. that's why our, the, the logo for our, production co for, for our production company is the padlock in the form of a six, because once you unlock the secret of what's going on in the days of Noah, everything else starts to fall into place, yeah. especially as it pertains to the last day. In the, in, in the vaults and the archives are two separate things beneath the Vatican. The archives is what everybody knows about. There's documents under there, hidden documents, documents that nobody has ever seen, uh, except those who have permission uh, by the Holy See. But there's also vaults under the Vatican where artifacts are hidden. And we discovered proof, and we show in our film, uh, that in fact, this isn't just some sort of a conspiracy, it is the truth that the Vatican has had access to hidden artifacts, especially artifacts relating to the reality of the world before the flood of Noah that they have confiscated and hidden away 
uh, or covered up. No. So here's the question. Can I say why? Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. Why? Right. Why? The why? ones who control the past determine the future. Uh. If you can control the narrative of the past, then you can control the narrative that is coming in the future, i.e. the deception. Wow. So the deception that's coming is going to be so powerful. The Bible calls it a great delusion or great deception. And it's the great deception. And again, it is the greatest deception that the world has ever seen. And it's going to be directly related with the ancient world. The is looking for up on Mount Graham. Well, it's not just the Catholic Church. It's also the University of Arizona. It's a consortium of, of, of groups up there, but, they, but led by the Vatican. And, of course, they, they, they speak very tongue-in-cheek about... Um, aliens and and uh, Planet X and, and, and these sort of things, although they don't call it Planet X. And and supposedly they're looking for exo-worlds, looking for exoplanets where the existence of alien life uh, is feasible. So planets that have um, water and the appropriate chemical composition in their atmosphere. This is what uh, they're looking for. This is what they say they're looking for. But as Steve will tell you, when you go, when you talk to people who are in the in, in the um, in the black world, in other words, in, in in the black operations, and they will tell you that these things are referred to as the gods of the Sumerians. The gods of the Sumerians are returning is the idea. And when we talk about, we mentioned Zechariah Sitchin and the ancient astronaut theory. Well, part of the lie that I believe that is coming has to do with this idea that in the past, human beings were not alone on this planet. The gods of the, the so-called gods of the Sumerians, the Anunnaki, were here with us. Now, I don't know if they're going to li literally say it was the Anunnaki, but they're definitely at some point going to reveal to the world that the human race is not alone. We're not alone in the universe, and we were not alone on the earth, and that they are, in fact, and have been for many years in contact with non-human entities. And I believe this announcement is going to come from the Vatican. I believe that the Vatican is going, in other words, from the Pope. I believe that the Vatican is going to lead the way on this. Now, for those of us who believe in the scriptures, this should not come as a surprise to us that we are not alone uh, in the universe because we are, we are the human race made in the image of God. But there are other entities also that have inhabited the earth and that move in the different realms in the heavens and on the earth with us, non-human um, uh, entities. Obviously, we know about angels. And you guys are familiar, familiar with the narrative of Genesis 6, the fallen angels, which some apocryphal works describe as the watchers. In fact, the Bible, the book of Daniel, also calls them watchers. Descended to the earth. This was a rebellion. This was an act of insubordination against God. Exactly. They descended to the earth, and they took wives from the children, uh, from the daughters of men, and they bred hybrids, right. and these hybrids were giants. But not only did they do this, other apocryphal works also, and, and not only apocryphal works, not only is it in the Bible, not only is it in the apocryphal works, but in every major culture around the earth, every major civilization around the earth tells the same story Amen. in different terms. So yeah. the names change, the descriptions change, but yeah. it is the same it's story the same. of the gods descending to the earth, breeding with the daughters of men, and creating the hybrid demigods of old. And of course, the, to the Greeks, the Titans, and so forth. And, but not only did they copulate with human women, uh, they also copulated with animals. The angels, yeah. these, these, these rebellious, uh, reprobate entities, also copulated with animals and created a host, a mess, a genetic mess on the earth. And God wiped out everything at Noah's time in the flood for a reason. It was awful. It was a genetic mess. And he like, wiped it out, and man doesn't want to uh, agree to that. But the, the Bible says it, and it... Right, we referenced said. before that we have proof that at least in one case the, the, the Vatican had special knowledge um, concerning some of the ancient artifacts and, and um, megalithic constructions that, that nobody else knew about. And one of the specific case that we deal with to prove this fact is in Cusco, Peru, where we talked to a very famous researcher and explorer, Spanish researcher and explorer named Anselm P. Rambla, who went to Peru, to Cusco, Peru, and um, was shown by the prior, by the priest of the, it's called the, it's called the Convent of Santo Domingo, it's a very famous place in Cusco, Peru, um, where there's a church built, and this used to be what's called the Coricancha. The Inca ruled 
uh, the Incan Empire was based in Cusco. And when the Incan Empire existed before the Spanish uh, destroyed it, their capital was Cusco, and their, their most holy site was what's known as the Coricancha. Well, after the Spanish uh, deposed the Inca, the, the Dominicans took over the, the Coricancha, and they constructed a church on top of it. And if you're not aware, it is, it is the M.O. Of, of the Holy See to put their churches, to build their churches and religious structures, different religious structures, on top, in many cases, of very, very interesting ancient archaeological sites. Hmm. And there's a number of reasons why they do this. Yeah. A very practical reason is just a show of dominance. The Church of Rome has conquered this pagan religion. But there's another reason, because... In many cases, there are bones and there are artifacts hidden underneath these structures. And it is the confiscation of these bones and the control of the information that they portent that, that is the prerogative of Rome. And so, in uh, Cusco, the, the, the Church of the Dominicans was built up on top of the most holy site of the Inca called the Coricancha. And Anselm P. Rambla, again, was taken by one of the head priests, the head priest of the convent at the time, this was in 1982, and he was brought into a, there was a trap door on the floor of the church that was covered over with an altar. They moved the altar out of the way because he asked this priest about a legend. And this legend is known as the Shinkana in Quechuan, and that's the, the native language uh, that the Inca spoke. And the Shinkana is, is, is a famous legend in South America, and what it is, is it is a vast underground, a network of underground tunnels, ancient underground tunnels, and caverns, and passageways. But we're talking about vast, immense tunnels that run for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Keep in mind, this is prehistoric. And, and these are manufactured tunnels, in many cases, that connect to natural caverns. Um, but, and they're, and they're not only are they tunnels, they're also lined in some cases with megalithic walls underground. So anybody who has any kind of an engineering background immediately recognizes the problems that ancient people would run into trying to, to construct this vast underground network called the Shinkana. And so that's why it's been considered to be a legend, because it simply couldn't be true that there's this underground network running for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of miles in some cases. That's an ancient network that was built by some ancient people. So it's just a legend. Historians have written it off as a legend. It's not a legend. It exists. And Anselm P. Rambla proved that it existed, and he found the entrance to a part of this tunnel hidden, concealed beneath the convent of Santo Domingo, the church of the Dominicans wow. in Cusco. Amazing. And he saw it with his own eyes. And there's doorways and arches and in, gates and in, things. In this case, the, 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 this, this tunnel led from, uh, from the Coricancha, where the convent was built on top, all the way. It was, this one was just a mile-long corridor going, corridor going to the Sacsayhuaman, which is a megalithic fortress, one of the most impressive megalithic fortresses on the face of the earth. It's called Sacsayhuaman, and it is located about a mile outside of Cusco, Peru. And this tunnel ran from underneath uh, the church all the way to underneath the uh, Sacsayhuaman. And the, the significance of this is that for all these years, the reality of this tunnel, the re not just this particular tunnel, but this tunnel system, the Shinkana, this, the, the, the vast underground, ancient underground tunnel system has been, has been written off as a myth as a legend, and yet the Vatican has known of its existence, that it isn't that uh, Okay, so I, ha I have a very, may, as Jim would maybe use this term, stupid question, but so how does this pertain to us right now today? How does this affect us? Well, in our film, we take a lot of time to first of all prove to people, being at these sites personally, these megalithic sites, Prove to people that, that, first of all, this is real. This isn't fantasy. Somebody was building in the antediluvian world, the world before the flood, on a scale and with technology that we can't even reproduce today. And they're coming back. That's the thing. They're coming back. Because 
object. History repeats. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, because God, well, the because days of Noah, so in the, Bible. the days of Noah. And so, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I understand your question. When right. people ask me all the time, why is this relevant? Because right. the very technology, the very evil nature, if you don't even think about the Incan Mayans and Aztecs, oh, they yeah. weren't vegans or vegans, okay? No. They, they ate people. And right. for such a long time, they tried to cover that up. Yeah. But see, this is what's critical. So when you understand, and, and I use a little bit of, well, I attempt the humor at least, because it is such a heavy subject. Mm -hmm. It is heavy. I only know this, that when God sent the children of Israel into the promised land, mm -hmm. he told them to kill every man, woman, and child. Do you know that probably 80% of Christians don't think that's fair? It, really, you know? And, and, and people would always ask me that. And then the answer came. Because they were hybrids, they weren't human beings. Ah. They were half and half. So the enemy, and see, that set me free too, you know, because I didn't have an answer before this. This is critical. I say the same thing in the United States with military bases. The military bases, there, there's an underground tunnel system, the legends, the myths, and the reality, you know, that the Word of God is that in the last days there's nothing that's been hidden that won't be made known, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so, so why this is important? But the church, so many of the church are not even curious. But That's why I something? think the young people, if they only knew some of these things, the kids would be curious enough to maybe do some work on all this the kind of thing. The world has substituted superheroes for biblical heroes, exactly. okay? Yeah. The, 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 exactly. The, yeah. oh, we, 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 we live in a comic book world oh. now where the truth has to be hidden at all costs. It's not in the by and by. They no. are mixing humans and animals. They did it in 1947 no. in the Antarctic, okay? The inhuman... It's, is that in this book? Yeah, it's in the... Uh, uh, this is in the big Empire beneath you. And yeah. I'm going to say something. Can I just say this? You and Tom make the biggest books you can use these as around a cult and sight or be you know that's right. yeah and that and that's, that's really right. critical because all again today. all of the genetic manipulation what people don't understand when Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun for that yeah. which will be has already been or that's that right. which has been will already be you know right. but you can do it either way but, but the point being is is that the entire third right will lead to the fourth right, and everything was built around a cult and psychic experience, demons, fallen angels, and, and so what's important, uh, hey, Jim, what Tim did, and I'm just filling the blanks real quick, and then you can share, I mean, the most provocative writer-author of the whole uh, Aliens Created Us movement, the Anunnaki, that's a Sumerian name for the false god, tell him about um, the, the, the gentleman that you interviewed, the billionaire guy, and what he basically said about who showed up at Zachariah Sitchin. Understand this, we're on the biblical side, he's on the other side, the aliens are coming back. In our film, again, this is, this is the ancient astronaut theory, Zachariah Sitchin is, one of, Sitchin is considered to be one of the fathers of ancient astronaut theory, which, which basically contends that the human race was, was genetically uh, altered, actually a hominid species on earth was genetically altered to create the human race and so the gods created us is basically the narrative, the aliens created us and, uh, and they're coming back and that's, that's in a nutshell the ancient alien narrative and um, many, there's many Christians who are being frankly beguiled by that narrative because, precisely because of the megaliths and stuff like that, and, and these guys go and they, they, they use the same kind of stuff that we're talking about to prove the flood of Noah and all this kind of stuff. They're using it to prove the ancient astronaut theory. But the, what Steve's saying is that what most people don't realize is that Zechariah Sitchin was not only, not only was he uh, crafting this, he, he was translating the ancient documents of the Sumerians and coming up with this narrative, but he was also in contact with entities that that he called the Anunnaki, and that's something that most people don't realize, something that's in our film uh, and that we reveal. Mm -hmm. And so it, it kind of puts a whole new spin for the people who are in the ancient alien theory. They don't realize that this guy was actually being contacted by entities, mm -hmm. which, of course, Hitler. which of course we would consider to be demonic mm -hmm. entities. Mm -hmm. But the issue really when you deal with the Holy See is that, and in, in, in this is something that we break down in our film, 
is that the institution of Rome, the Roman institution, the Holy See, the Holy Roman Catholic Church is not the church. It's, it's an institution that, that really has its roots in ancient Babylon. Uh, listen, the, the traditional Protestant view of the Pope, the traditional Protestant view mm -hmm. for many years uh, is that the Pope is an, is an antichrist in the earth. Now, in fact, exactly the, the title so of, of Christ... That's the, what's the role of the Pope then in all? We've been talking a lot yeah, that's about what, it. That's what I'm getting to. So, so the, 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 the title that the, that the Pope carries, uh, Vicar of Christ, literally means in place of Christ. He is an antichrist in the earth. This isn't my opinion. This is the traditional Protestant view of the Pope of Rome. That's right. I mean, every Protestant denomination in its beginning it, held this view of the Pope exactly. of Rome. Exactly. And even the and even the, the believers who were not a part of the of the of the Catholic Church who rejected the Pope of Rome from the beginning considered him to be an antichrist in the earth. But you're, are you saying he's the Antichrist? Are you no, saying not the final, spirit? not the final Antichrist. Again, traditionally, he was considered an Antichrist. Remember, Paul said there are many Antichrists. Yes. And so he is considered an Antichrist in the earth. This gentleman, I'll call him that, has done everything he can to denigrate Jesus Christ, to say all roads lead to heaven, to basically not defend the Christians that are being persecuted to embrace Islam, to basically make statements, you know, embracing all the anti-biblical standards that traditional Catholics stand for, okay? That's the point. That's where the war, you mark my words, the war is coming in the Catholic Church. I'm talking physical war. I'm not talking, you know, spiritual arguing. There, there's going to be a war because here's the deal. The enemy, the, the hater of mankind, the hater of Jesus Christ, you know why we're where we're at? Real simple. You keep asking. I got the question because I asked that question so many times. The Lord finally answered me. It is because we fail to uplift Jesus Christ, because we fail to be the salt of the earth, because we failed to be the light, because we feared man more than God, because we didn't stand up for the unborn, because we didn't stand up for the prayer in school, because we wouldn't stand up. And now, guess what? It comes to the point. There's no one standing up for us except Jesus. The one who we abandon will be the one who saves us. Wow. The, the, and I'm telling you point blank, that's why you, know, you can get 50 different guys on prophecy, but here's the thing, at the end of the day, it's about Jesus. Yeah. Without him, and, you know, John 15, without Jesus, we can do nothing. Right. And my answer to that is, I say, Lord, without you, I don't want to do anything. So when the Pope has made the statement, and his top theologians, astronomers, this is what Tom does so marvelously, is laying out their statements about aliens, they're expecting uh, uh, the return of the space brethren, the Pentagon is calling the gods of the Sumerians are returning, the Word of God says the gates of hell are opening and won't prevail, you know, the bottom line is, it is the, it is the end times, the end of the age, mm -hmm. and again, the Lord himself is the one who can deliver us. You know, God saves his people, and when God arises, only then will his enemies, our enemies, be scattered. Yeah. He's waiting for the people of God to believe him, that number one, he is who he says he is, number two, he's done what he said he's do, and number three, he's going to pour out his spirit without measure. Like I started off saying in the beginning, the greatest deception in history is about to unfold and we believe that at least the, the the religious side of it is being led by rome anything that has the name of christ attached to it gone you know any evidence that jim i don't believe it was uh, in your case what you were doing in the holy land i don't believe anything is by circumstance because again whatever you would prove that validates the word of the lord has to be stopped at all means okay by all means and what's happened is we it's not only normalcy bias but because good people who are trying to walk right before the lord don't understand the nature of evil they cannot identify the evil when it's right before them exactly and that that's that's a maximum life
They say this thing had been dead for maybe a day or two. Uh, we estimated his size at approximately 12 to 10 feet tall. The giant killed the first team that they came across. He was extremely big and fast and agile for a guy that size. The popes and the agents of the Holy See have known about the giants for many centuries. And do you believe that they have artifacts from the past that would help explain some of what's going on? Absolutely sure. The Vatican knows all the secrets. Saviors. They seem to be intentionally creating dogma that is going to position the Roman Catholic Church to be at the forefront of an official disclosure moment. The Vatican is involved in ufology in ways that they can't even imagine. So while we're standing here in the headquarters of the Jesuits, tell us about Mount Grand. They are constantly monitoring things with the Lucifer device. Sometimes they have to wait for all of the UFOs to get out of the way. I would like to tell you more about the career switching. He told me, John Mario, one night I wake up and I saw an Anunnaki sitting on my bed. History is being repeated. The days of Noah are returning. The gods are returning to the earth to dwell among men and mingle their seed with the human race. Only the truth can prepare us for the lie that's coming. said if it's not in the Bible then we're not going to deal with it. We've already established that it is in Genesis 6 but there's another scripture that a lot of times we actually don't deal with because it's not in our current translation of the Old Testament. But the Septuagint, the Old Testament translation that the apostles carried around with them, it says this in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 13. I have a Septuagint right here before me. In Isaiah chapter 13 whenever it talks about in time prophetic events, this is what it says. Lift up a standard on the mountain of the plain. Exalt the voice to them. Beckon with the hand. Open the gates. Ye rulers, I give command and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. Mm. It says this in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 13 verse 3 in the Septuagint. The Greek, whenever the Hebrew was translated to the Greek, the same Old Testament that the apostles would have carried, it says that giants are going to come back in the end times to fulfill the Lord's wrath. Out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, right? Well, we've already established this is six thoroughly, and now we have here in Isaiah chapter 13. And can I make one final point? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, of course, that we get asked all the time, why does any of this matter? Why should we care about any of this? Well, I would ask the same question about any subject that we take any time whatsoever yeah. to, in our lives, to spend time on. Yeah. And, and Gary made a great point yesterday that we ought to be m more hungry as believers, more hungry for the truth than any other faction of people on the face of the earth. Absolutely. And we ought to have more truth that, about everything. Yeah. Than, than, because, I mean, the, the, Jesus isn't just the author of scripture he's the creator of the universe <laughs> and so everything everything that is comes from him and so you know i always ask people well if you if your son or daughter was going to high school 
and they decided not to teach history, would that upset you? If they decided not to teach math, would, would you be upset about that? Or would you have the attitude, well, why does it matter anyway? <laughs> you wouldn't, because it matters. It matters. We know fundamentally that history matters, don't we? Yeah. So how much more fundamental is, is it for us to have the true history of this world that we live in, of the earth, especially as it pertains to the gospel? Yeah. Much wow. more. And so that is, the, the, that's a, that's a, on a very practical level, that's why it matters. Among the other reasons why it matters, you can, even if you just boil it down to that, we want to know the truth. Yes. And this is, and, 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 and again, I'll make the, the final statement that if you want to understand what's coming in the future, in the prophetic sense, you have to understand what was happening in the world before our yeah, country I, to go down. Here, here is the issue. The issue, ladies and gentlemen, is that everything is designed to overwhelm us at one time with all the different crises. That way they keep us in a state or a condition of pretty much perpetual worry, perpetual concern, and the whole idea of the communist takeover of the United States is coming to pass right before our eyes. And it's to overwhelm the system. And, you know, it's, it's tragic, Zach. It's tragic, Jim. It's that by design, they want to use anything they have at their disposal when the time comes. And we were talking earlier in the meeting, and Gary ran through the executive order. So it's like they're, they're generating their own situation by which they can control all variables. And Jim, is it okay to have him run through the executive order? Because you were blown away by that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, the executive order we're talking about is 13603. I'm sure that'll be on your screen. I want you to, to, to go online and pull it up and look at it. An executive order is uh, the privilege of a president to simply write into law a policy. And, and in effect, it's legislation. And when you look at what Obama did with the Executive Order 13603 a few years ago, you will be astounded. Because what it allows him to do is to declare an emergency for any reason, economic otherwise, without the approval of Congress. So he literally has dictatorial power. Now when he declares an emergency, what happens? And, and again, in this Executive Order, first of all, the government acquires absolute ownership of all resources, of all oil and gas, of all food, of all money. They even have the opportunity at their discretion to draft you into a civilian workforce without compensation. Now there's a word for that, slavery. Mm. Obama signed an executive order that gives him right, the right to enslave the American people if he decides to declare an emergency for any reason. Now, that sounds wild and crazy. I don't want to be a slave. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to do a little homework. Google this and read it for yourself. Are you sure about this? <laughs> it's astounding. How come I don't know about this? I must be living in a cave or something. That's horrible. That well, can't even be. Not in the United States of America. This is no longer the United States of America that you know. Most people, and, and let me just say this, most people don't understand that everything you think the country was and still is, is no longer. We don't have the guarantees and the last, uh, the last thing they'll go for is the guns. But the executive order, it, it, literally means, it literally means that you are absolutely at the mercy of the government, and it's women too. And what's tragic is they'll break up families and separate the kids. You know, it's no fun to tell the truth sometimes because the ramifications are so great. But the executive orders basically put us, even on levels that some of the dictatorships around the world, some of these guys like Stalin and Hitler should be you know, proud because that's the policies, that's the policies they're following. So the executive orders are a matter of law and implementation. That's why you've watched US military be destroyed. That's why the veterans in this country are being destroyed. And the whole purpose is, is to basically implement whatever crisis they want at whatever time and be able to take over everything. And, and somebody said, well, they're coming for my stuff. I said, no, they're coming for your life. And that's what people can't focus because of normalcy bias. And normalcy bias simply means this. The human brain cannot entertain such drastic interruption of that which they feel they're in control of in their own life. Wow. In essence, none of us are in control at that point. So 
you know, I, Gary and I were talking earlier, and I want to share something. When I heard that Hillary was going to walk, okay, I got physically sick. And I, I just started weeping inside. And God said, go to Isaiah 6. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 6.1, I'll, I'll quote the first verse for you. In the year that King Uzziah died, mm -hmm. I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his presence, the train filled the temple. And here's what the Lord, and I want everybody to pray about it. You've got to understand that the only thing that's going to keep us in this hour is the power, the presence, and the promises of God and our recognizing the lateness of the hour. And Jesus warned us of all these things. All prophecy, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So this is where we're at. And I challenge you, I challenge everyone that's in, in gonna see this on television to take it to the Lord in prayer because that, that, that struck me to the heart. Now, yep. there is no example in the New Testament or the Old where God did not warn his people before it happened. No. No, no, or nada, 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 okay? Niat for the Russians out there. The point is, the, the idea is that it is always based on the Word of God. Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveals the secrets to his servants, the prophets. Go into your history of the Old Testament. How many people obeyed the prophets they claim that they honored or venerated? Not many. Noah did. We're here because of that. Joseph. Joseph was warned of God that the famine was going to come. He prepared. And so the, the, the idea that it's not faith, I'll tell you what, I've talked to enough preachers, uh, members of their congregations, you know why they don't want you to prepare? Because you'll wreck their offerings, okay? In other words, they're more important than you. But I like King David. King David went into the granaries, took out the grain, and fed the people. And God is absolutely moving outside of the confines of what used to be the church, and he's in the highways and byways. That's why this television program is so important. And the scripture says, Brother Jim, he's, he's sending his angels to compel people to come into the kingdom. I wish Second Chronicles 7.14 was in effect. God's telling his people to, you know, humble themselves, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. But unfortunately, how many of you remember the Jesus movement 40 oh, yeah. years ago? Oh, okay, yeah. I was a poster child for salvation. Went from the guttermost, the uttermost, one day. And that was because of Jesus, okay? All of America's problems, especially in the churches, they left their first love. We are in the period of the Laodicean God. church. The salt has lost its savor. And Jim, what you're saying is you're a voice in a desert of denial of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And I, I was reading uh, John 15, Tim and I, earlier this morning. The bottom line of John 15 is, without me, Jesus, you can do nothing. When the Jesus movement was effective, and when everybody is still standing that I know that came out of that, it wasn't about doctrine, you know, it wasn't about crazy stuff, but it was the Bible was the Word of God, Jesus is the Savior, and everybody spoke of the Lord and the, the magnificence of his salvation. You cannot overcome the devil without your testimony. That's and right. unfortunately, too many people don't have a testimony, they, and they can't even pass the test. Right. I tell people all the time, it's not that we say we know Jesus. The Bible says, does Jesus know us? You know, and that's really critical. People, this is what I've been praying for all you and everybody out that will see this. I'm asking God for a transformative, miraculous reintroduction reintroduction of the power of God in their lives. Because look, all this stuff, all this stuff is in play. And it's by God's grace that we are alive. If you understood, and I understood, again, back to normalcy bias, and Tim was talking about cognitive dissonance, if it, even the, uh, the idea that Islam would be allowed to flourish and ladies and gentlemen, we're seeing the most brutal acts of violence against our brothers and sisters worldwide. Thank God for Franklin Graham. Thank yeah. God for Franklin Graham. Yeah. I love him. Yeah. And I want to share something. I think you guys had Anne Graham. Yeah. And Anne Graham wrote a book. I want to say this to everybody out in television land in this audience. The most wonderful book, in my opinion, Anne Graham Lotz, is Just Give Me Jesus. Okay? I don't want foreign policy. I don't want BS, Bravo Sierra, and the other terms associated with it. <laughs> I want to people to once again fall in love. You're here, most of you, if I ask you to raise your hand, 
How many are you here because you're seeking truth and you're not getting it in the fellowship that you, you know, I, I think that's a fair representation. And see, the, this gospel is going to the highways and byways. And the people that are seeing angels around this place, the Bible says that the Lord says he's sending his angels and compelling people. Timothy Alvarino is the director and the writer of the True Legends series. And God brought him into my life in order to basically pass on what I know. You know, at 65, and that's questionable only by, you know, chronological age, because I had arrested development. I love that word. I mean, I was really arrested, uh, you know. And people would say to me, you need to grow up. And I'd say, why? But the point being is, is that Tim has gone to Rome and Sardinia and Malta in search of this. And people say, well, you guys, you're making a big deal out of it. No, you don't understand, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest deception in history. Tom Horn, you've heard him. Those of you who have heard Tom Horn, this is the greatest deception in history. So I'd like to turn it over to Tim and just let him tell you, as the, Tim, give him the bottom line on True Legends, you know, the unholy sea. Timothy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Great to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'll start with, as Steve said, the bottom line, which is what he just expressed. The greatest deception the world has ever seen is about to break forth on the earth. And that is a fact. And all the pieces and parts are coming together for it now. Uh, we have been developing a series called True Legends. And for those who are unfamiliar, it's a documentary film series. Uh, we have a first episode, Technology of the Fallen, and that we have already produced. It's, it's been out for a year. And then our second episode, which is called The Unholy Sea, was yeah. just released a couple of days ago. Incredible. Very eye-opening. And the... It's really interesting because the first episode that we did, we spent most of our time in Peru. In fact, we spent all of our time in Peru. And we were documenting the, the megaliths, and we were documenting some of the uh, pre-flood constructions. Now, let me explain something for those who don't understand. Um, the term megalith simply refers to ancient constructions that were devised, that were built with extremely large stones. And we're talking hundreds of tons. We're talking about edifices that could not be constructed today using, uh, using cranes, industrial cranes. So we're dealing with a level of technology and engineering capability in the prehistoric past that in, in many cases we cannot reproduce today. So, so let me make that clear. What you just said was that they were moving stones thousands of years ago and we can't even move these stones today right. with our modern technology. In some cases, yes. Wow. wow. And not only are they moving these stones, these constructions are referred to as Cyclopean construction, Cyclopean architecture. Cyclopean architecture refers to these megalithic constructions that are built without the use of mortar. So not only are they wow. moving these large stones and, and configuring them, uh, and constructing them, they're configuring them without mortar. And when you watch our, when you watch our documentary series, you'll see some of the locations that we visit, such as uh, in Puno, uh, Peru. We go to in the first episode, we go to Bolivia. We visit a place called Tiwanaku, and um, we show you some of these constructions, and we tell you something about them that you're not going to hear on the Discovery Channel, on the History <laughs> Channel. We tell you that these constructions are pre-flood constructions. That these edifices were built by a hybrid race in the world before the flood of Noah. And some of you have probably seen the, uh, the Ancient Alien series that's on, I don't know if it's on the History Channel, Discovery Channel, but there's, but there's many programs coming out now dealing with this topic. But what they're not doing is they're not telling you the whole truth. They're just telling you part of the truth. Because the whole truth is contained within the pages of Scripture. Wow. And so uh, we're dealing with pre-flood constructions in Episode 1, and we continue to deal with it in Episode 2 in the Unholy Sea. But what's interesting about Episode 2 is we didn't know, Steve and I didn't know exactly what the content of our second episode was going was gonna to center around. And we somehow find, found ourselves in Rome at the Vatican. Because we realized that very literally, when dealing with the ancient, with the antediluvian constructions and the antediluvian races and the what I call the empire of the gods that existed in the world before the flood of, of Noah, there's a vast cover-up. 
And the, this cover-up extends, and Steve writes extensively about this in his book, True Legends, which our film is based on, this book here, by Steve Quayle, True Legends. And we talk about, and Steve talks about in his book, the cover-up by the Smithsonian uh, Institution, hiding the bones of giants in the United States. That's right. Because the bones of giants can be found and are indeed found. That's right. All over. Okay, I'm, I'm just really getting into the this. Books about it. Right. But he yeah. believes giants are going to be on the earth again. Do you believe that? Well, I not only believe it, but I interviewed uh, on True Legends, the uh, second one, The Unholy Sea. We have the interview of the pilot that flew a dead giant out of Afghanistan. How many of you are familiar with that story? And that was in I'm two, not. 2005. Okay, let me tell you the story. During our war in Afghanistan, special operations teams went in looking for the Taliban, looking for all the terrorists. Well, they, a special operations team got killed by a giant in the mountain caves because that's where all, they were all hanging out. First brought it public, took the pilot. Now, I'm talking about a living giant, 12 feet tall, that completely wiped out a group of, you know, our best Marines. A thousand pounds. Do you see that picture? Look, guys. Look yep. at this on the That's screen. my artist. I'm not an artist. Brian Snowdy did that. One of the best sketch artists in the world. And this, this is in the book.